So I'm going to be speaking about recent advances in the management of locally advanced pancreatic cancer. Here are my disclosures, and shown here is the outline of the teaching points I hope to be able to touch upon today. So uh, in terms of some background, up to 40% of patients who are newly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer present without metastases on imaging, but have locally advanced and unresectable disease. And historically, we know that the survival of these patients has only been marginally better than those patients who present with metastases in the range of 9 to 11 months, and that a very small percentage of patients were able to uh, undergo definitive surgery. We also know that these patients suffer significant morbidity referable to their local tumor burden, pain, bleeding, duodenal, biliary obstruction, and we heard about that earlier today. And interestingly, the patterns of failure and the biology of this subset of patients is not well understood, surprisingly. I think we often view this as a systemic disease, but in one small autopsy series from Johns Hopkins, 28% of patients actually died without metastatic disease at autopsy and died of the local complications. So this is a heterogeneous entity. There's local-only biology, and there's disseminated biology. So in terms of definitions, we've heard about this uh, from Todd's talk this morning. It's important to keep in mind um, that non-metastatic pancreatic cancer is comprised of a, of a continuum from resectable without any vascular involvement to unresectable due, due to the extent of the involvement of adjacent vascular structures. And although our consensus organizations have defined discrete anatomic criteria which deline delineate the three categories of non-metastatic disease, resectable, borderline resectable, and locally advanced, as you heard about earlier. These definitions uh, have not been uniform, uh, and they certainly are subject to inter-observer and inter-institution variability. So this has really challenged um, clinical trial design. It's hampered our interpretation of the data that's out there. In terms of locally advanced unresectable disease, in most cases we know it when we see it. These patients present on imaging with uh, extensive involvement of the SMA or celiac axis, what's described as encasement, greater than 180 degree contact, or extensive involvement of the SMV or portal vein that precludes resection and or reconstruction. And although there have been a number of definitions put forward over the last decade, I think what is most widely used now are the, the NCCN criteria. Actually, these do change from NCCN version uh, 2 to 3 and so forth, but not a lot. And so I've just listed those criteria here. Now, what about borderline resectable? We heard about that earlier today. So this uh, entity is on the continuum of vascular involvement. These are patients who present with more limited vascular involvement than unresectable patients, and thus technically may be resectable. But we know that their surgical outcomes are inferior with a high risk of a positive margin or mo more complex operation with more morbidity. The definition of borderline resectable has been really tough to nail down, and again, very much institution and operator dependent, and that again has challenged us in terms of clinical trial design and management. In fact, ASCO, uh, my professional society, in their guidelines paper on pancreatic cancer in 2016, opted to jettison the term borderline resectable and simply categorizes patients as those for whom upfront resection is appropriate and recommended versus those for whom initial preoperative therapy is appropriate and recommended. And I think this works in our daily practice, although, again, in terms of trial design and trying to understand data, um, it is not helpful. What about AJCC staging? We heard about that earlier from Marie. So AJCC staging does not address resectability at diagnosis. And so for clinical staging purposes, we default to a four-tier clinical classification system based on the imaging resectable, borderline, locally advanced, unresectable, and disseminated. Um, in terms of evaluation, most patients present to their uh, cancer physician uh, with a CT scan in hand of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and this is an important staging evaluation because it divides patients into metastatic versus non-metastatic disease. And for those patients who have no overt metastases, it is important, as we learned this morning, to repeat the CT scan with a biphasic pancreatic protocol. Um, that better assesses vascular involvement and informs our decisions about resectability or potential for re resectability in the future and often changes our management. All of these patients will undergo an endoscopic ultrasound-guided biopsy as they don't have metastatic sites to biopsy, and that often gives us imaging information as well that's informative, especially regarding portal vein involvement. It's worth thinking about whether to 
uh, do a diagnostic or staging laparoscopy to look for occult metastatic disease. And the reason for that is we are increasingly taking these patients to the operating room for resection. And what we don't want to do is operate on someone who already has presented with a disseminated or systemic biology. We don't know how to select these patients, but certainly patients with a high CA199 are concerning for having disseminated disease. And we, uh, we are emphasizing multidisciplinary evaluation today. That's what this event is all about, and that has become an NCCN black box warning, if you will. That's the first page of the pancreatic cancer guidelines, and uh, very important. So turn now to management of this entity. Um, so here's some bullets about the current uh, state of affairs. So the optimal management of locally advanced disease is controversial, and there is no internationally or even nationally embraced standard approach. That said, initial chemotherapy with a combination chemo regimen in fit patients is the current recommendation from NCCN, from ASCO, and from ESMO. But there's no clear evidence to support one chemo regimen over another, and there is remarkably limited prospective data with the use of modern chemotherapy. And by modern chemotherapy, I'm referring to fulfirinox and gemcitabine and abraxane. These are two regimens that have been effective in the metastatic setting and have improved survival, and we've been using them for about six or seven years. There are many, many unresolved questions. So I mentioned what's the optimum chemotherapy and what's the optimum duration? Should we keep patients on maintenance chemotherapy as we do in colon cancer? What is the role of postoperative uh, post radiation? Many patients will get radiation, but I don't think we fully understand the benefits. Does it confer a survival benefit, and if not, a at least a progression-free survival benefit or a quality of life benefit? And then what technique and dose should we be using? And you'll be hearing about that from Dr. Zhou Hung next. And then how about the role of surgery? Our goal always is to get these patients to surgery as the definitive, hopefully curative treatment, but we're realistic. Most of these patients are not going to be cured even with surgery. So how do we select patients for surgery? So there's two considerations. We'd like to select the patients with local only biology, but unfortunately we have no biomarkers to predict that. And we'd like to select patients who will have a successful surgical outcome with negative margins and low morbidity. So although there are many unanswered questions, um, it does appear that fulfirinox, the use of fulfirinox in locally advanced unresectable disease has had a meaningful in, uh, impact on the outcomes of these patients. And we have learned this um, from multiple single institution retrospective series, uh, from one prospective trial, which I'll talk about, one meta-analysis, and all of these uh, studies have shown that the median survival with the use of upfront fulfirinox is about two years. And this is substantially better than the median survival that was reported in many clinical trials with the old gemcitabine-based regimens of 9 to 11 months. And in addition, a much higher percentage of patients seem to become surgical candidates up to 40 percent uh, in some series. And most recently, we've heard about an emerging experience with gemcitabine and uh, NAB paclitaxel. So just to run through this data, um, this is the data from the meta-analysis um, by Sucre. Um, he looked at uh, 315 patients from 13 studies with locally advanced disease who received upfront fulfirinox. 26% underwent surgery, and the median survival was about two years. So this is uh, substantially better than what was seen with historical controls, and in fact, the median survival compares favorably uh, with the survival of patients who present with resectable disease. Uh, the only prospective uh, completed and reported trial of fulfirinox in locally advanced pancreas cancer was our study, um, an investigator-initiated trial conducted uh, at Yale and our uh, care centers. Um, we were looking at modified fulfirinox to improve tolerability in two cohorts, metastatic and the locally advanced cohort. The trial design is shown here. So patients received, uh, it was a phase two study, so all patients received modified fulfirinox for eight cycles with scans after cycle four and eight. And if they had stable or responding disease after eight cycles, uh, fo the subsequent treatment was at the uh, treating investigator's discretion. Continue chemotherapy, move to radiation, move on to surgery. So 31 patients entered into the study, 65% completed the fulfirinox, 35% discontinued fulfirinox, and the reasons are shown here. Uh, notably, no patients discontinued treatment for progression. 
and the results are summarized on the slide. So in the 31 patients, there were no new safety signals. This was reasonably well tolerated. The disease control rate was 100%, so no patients progressed on fulfirinox, and the response rate by resist criteria in terms of shrinkage was 17%. In this small series, 42% uh, of patients were able to undergo surgery, and all had R0 resections, and nine of the 13 had no negative disease, which is, a, although the numbers are small, obviously, a much higher presented percentage than what we see in patients who undergo upfront resection with resectable disease. And our median survival was around two years at 26.6 months. So again, much better than historical controls, incremental progress. And then just a few weeks ago at ASCO's GI Symposium, we heard the results from the phase two LAPACT trial of NABPAC-Lataxol plus gemcitabine uh, in this patient population. And the trial design was similar to ours. In this case, uh, a phase two study with six cycles of NABPAC-Lataxol plus gem. And in the non-progressors, they then went on to investigators' choice of continued chemo, radiation, or surgery. 42% of patients did not complete the induction, and the reasons are shown here, adverse events being the most common reason, followed by progressive disease. Um, the disease, uh, the response rate was 32%, 58% uh, stable disease, 5% progression. Three-quarters of the patients in this waterfall plot had some shrinkage of their tumor. Progression-free survival, 10.8 months, and at 12 months, the overall survival was 72%, with the median overall survival still to be reported out. They, they did do a quality of life assessment, and um, patients' overall global health status and their overall quality of life was maintained through day one of cycle six. So the, the summaries of this uh, study is shown here. Now, this is an important study because it's the first prospective study to look at nabpaclitaxel and GEM in this subset of patients. There were no new safety signals. The anti-tumor um, effects were promising. The resection rate here was a little bit lower um, than what we see with fulfirinox, um, but the survival uh, numbers, again, are better than historical controls and, again, incremental progress. So in this table, I'm just summarizing studies that have been done with induction chemotherapy. So the top two were conducted from around 2008 to 2011 with the older gemcitabine-based regimens. Um, and as you can see, the survival was about uh, 12 months, um, and the 12-month survival about 50%. And then on the bottom is our Yale Fulfirinox study and the LAPAC study. And I think it, it's convincing that we are improving uh, survivals. Um, we're prolonging life with these newer chemotherapy regimens. Uh, so again, incremental progress, although we still don't know what the long-term survival data is going to look like. So what do we do after induction chemotherapy? Um, and um, we don't know the answer to this question. Uh, most often, patients go on to radiation if they have not progressed. Um, although one study in the pre fulfirinox era, the LAP07 trial, showed no benefit of radiation after induction gemcitabine. Um, but the advances in chemotherapy, I think, really limit the application of this data to our current practice. And how about surgery? And I'm going to focus on that. Um, so who should undergo surgical exploration? Um, we want to select those patients with local-only biology and those who are going to have a successful R0 resection. So we can't predict local only biology, but can we predict a successful R0 resection? And what we've learned in the last few years from retrospective series is that the CT is limited uh, in predicting an R0 resection. And we know that the CT really cannot differentiate between residual tumor around blood vessels versus fibroinflammatory tissue around blood vessels after preoperative treatment. It's good at doing that de novo prior to treatment, but after treatment it becomes unreliable. So patients can have significant persistent vascular involvement on imaging who are able to achieve an R0 resection. So a number of institutions have published their experience and have tried to come up with criteria to help guide us. Um, and one was a, a, a group from France, and I'm just going to jump to the uh, schema here. So they looked at a handful of patients who presented with borderline and locally advanced. And in the 13 patients who had locally advanced disease by NCCN criteria, 
Seven still had locally advanced disease by NCCN criteria. They all underwent a successful resection, and uh, six of those were margin negative or R0 resections. And the um, MGH group um, looked at 40 patients um, with locally advanced disease, and 19 of those patients were still classified as locally advanced um, who went on to surgery and had a successful R0 resection. And they concluded that imaging after treatment no longer predicts unresectability. Um, so I've, I've shown here the author's sort of conclusions based on these small retrospective series. And the MGH group, for example, states that they advocate for surgery of all locally advanced patients after neoadjuvant fulfurinox in the absence of metastatic disease. So that is a, would be a significant change in how we manage these patients. Um, and are we ready to really adopt that? And I would say slow down. Um, these studies really have many limitations. They were retrospective studies looking only at patients who were taken to surgery after fulfurinox. So a very strong selection bias. It was a mix of patients. Some got RT, some didn't. We still don't know the long-term disease-free survival and how many patients are cured. And we don't know about the post-operative morbidity and what the quality of life was like for these patients. So um, in my final slides, here's the schema of the current standard of care. And the standard of care for, for locally advanced and borderline has really converged. So we generally recommend upfront chemo with either fulfurinox or gem napaclitaxel uh, for some duration. And for those patients who do not progress on induction, it's really the treating physician's uh, discretion or the interdisciplinary team to make a decision about what to do next, because we really don't have good data to, gu to guide us. Um, most patients will get radiation. We'll hear more about that. So um, to conclude some of the challenges that we're facing in this subset of patients, we have, there's a desperate need for reliable biomarkers to sort the local-only biology from the metastatic biology, because that will certainly inform treatment decisions. There's a huge need for well-designed randomized clinical trials to optimize our current standard of care. What is the role of radiation, for example? But unfortunately, strong beliefs on the part of investigators and institutions have really hampered the design of these types of clinical trials. And most importantly, we need better systemic agents. Um, and there are very few studies looking um, at novel agents in locally advanced disease. They're focused on metastatic disease. So we often don't have great uh, clinical trial options to offer our patients. Um, there are six randomized clinical trials in um, clinicaltrials.gov. I think the top two are going to answer the question about radiation, so those are important studies. There are many studies in the phase two uh, phase that are looking at SBRT, and uh, Kim will talk more about that, and a handful of studies looking at novel agents. So there's much work uh, to be done, uh, as I've summarized here. Thank you. <laughs>